Today my daughter visited me. It was unpleasant for both of us. And I don't think she left happy. Oh, she was very sweet, friendly, and accommodating. But too much time has passed, and the wound is too deep for me to reciprocate without much thought and soul-searching. She said what she wanted to say and left without getting what she came for. She wanted me back in her life. I said I'll think about it, and when she left, I cried. Megan is a grown woman with children of her own, but at the same time, she is the little girl I rocked on my lap when she was three. She is smart, articulate, attractive, and from what her sister says, a good wife and mother. I have to believe this because she is a copy of her mother. She even inherited her stubbornness. She is everything a parent could ever dream of. So, if she is so wonderful, then why have I not said a single word to her for five years until today? It all started with what her mother did. I remember the last words I said to Megan like it was yesterday. It was five years ago, at her mother's funeral, after one of the most emotional days of my life. I walked up to Megan at the graveside and told her, with all the gall I could muster, that she was as dead to me as the woman we had just laid in the ground. Then he stuck his index finger in my son Stuart's face and told him the same thing. Looking around the crowd of shocked spectators, I frowned at each one with an expression that made it clear that my words included them. The stunned reactions of my family and friends and their wide eyes will burn deep in my soul for the rest of my days. This was the pain I would take with me to my grave, the pain born of the destruction of our family, the death of their mother, and the loss of their father. I walked away from it all that day, holding the hand of my youngest daughter, Faye. I fell in love with Connie almost from the first minute we met. It's like we've been together all our lives. We fell in love and loved each other from that moment on. God must have used us as the model of a perfect couple because we were like apple pie and vanilla ice cream, great individually but absolutely the best together. Even before we said our vows, we were so close to each other that everyone said we were already long married. This was back in school. We got married after college and recently celebrated our 25th anniversary. Then something happened that I still cannot fully explain. Our 25th wedding anniversary was a big deal. It was a beautiful, sunny June day, and all our family and friends came together to celebrate with us. My father sat at the head of the table in a wheelchair with Connie's mother and father and all three of our children. All our friends and neighbors congratulated us and showered us with gifts that we could not use. Even the mayor of the city stopped by to give us a small gift from him and our friends on the city council. A sign declaring June 14th, Connie and Mark Jenkins Day. More than 200 people gathered under the big tent and laughed, ate, and danced until late in the evening. When it came time to renew our vows, I don't think there was a dry eye. I know for sure that Connie and I do not. But I didn't see anyone else. I didn't see our children standing next to us at the altar. I didn't see our families holding hands in the front row. And I certainly didn't see our golden retriever bow curled up at the preacher's feet. I saw nothing but Connie, the woman who completed me, the woman I love and always have loved, and the woman I plan to spend the rest of my life with, showing how much I had accomplished. Our eldest daughter, Megan, got married a month before our little celebration and only returned from her honeymoon a week ago. Stuart has just finished his second year of university, and our youngest, Faye, is in her first. It's good that everyone returned home. I would never say this out loud, but I miss the noise and crowds of the kids at home. I think Connie, too. At least for a while, we became a family again. A few days after our anniversary party... I was returning all the chairs, tables, and other party equipment to the rental place when my truck had a minor accident in the parking lot. I turned the corner too quickly and dented the headlight of the brand new Lexus. The police officer who took the accident report was one of the kids who grew up with Stuart and played on many of his sports teams. However, Greg was no longer a child. Now he was taller than me, and there was an air of authority in his figure that made him even taller. I watched him grow up and was as proud of him as I was of my own children. Having finished with our business, we just stood and chatted about nothing. The end of the conversation planted a seed that grew like a weed in my fertile mind. Well, Mr. Jenkins, Greg said, holding out his hand to me, 
It's time for me to go back to the station. It was great to see you again, and I'm so sorry I couldn't make it to your anniversary. My parents said I missed a really good time. I shook hands with a man who was trying to steal second base in the ninth and lower in baseball. He was always kicked out, but he grew into a man I was proud to call a friend. Yes, and tell Mrs. Jenkins to be careful and stop at stop signs in the future, he said with a mischievous smile. Next time I'll have to give her more than a warning. I'm sure my confused expression told the truth. Oh, damn. I didn't mean to say something inappropriate. Now he looked embarrassed. I immediately sensed his discomfort and tried to help him a little. At the same time, I was trying to understand what he was talking about. It's okay, Greg. Connie doesn't always tell me when she gets a driving ticket. She thinks that I will be angry with her and take away her license. I won't do it, but let her think so. Now so that I can take over at dinner tonight. What was there? I might want to tease her a little, that's all. Sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. Nothing special, really. My smile grew wider and I pleaded, there is nothing wrong. Just some light, friendly teasing, that's all. Now what happened? A couple of weeks ago, I think it was Saturday 31, your wife drove out of the Holiday Inn parking lot onto Highway 40 without stopping at the stop sign. She didn't hit anyone or interfere with traffic, but she sped away so quickly that I had to catch up with her and ask her to slow down. I should have punished her for missing a stop sign. But nothing bad happened, and she just got a warning. There was nothing special about it. No problem, Greg. You did the right thing. I will definitely tell her to watch how she drives and at the same time give her a little teasing. Thank you. It was nice to see you again. I unloaded the chairs and tables and then sat in the truck, thinking about that little conversation I had with Greg. Two weeks ago, the 31st to be exact, I was at my father's house for the weekend, helping with some things he was no longer able to do himself. This was also two weeks after Megan's wedding. I remember taking my dad to the nursing home that day to see if he would finally want to get rid of the old house and move into something smaller. He didn't want to, and I knew it would happen, but I had to try. I spent the whole of Saturday with him and returned home around 9 o'clock on Sunday evening. I didn't notice anything strange, and Connie didn't tell me anything about Greg's warning. She said she spent a quiet day at home reading. I thought Greg must have remembered something wrong because Connie would never lie to me, so I recorded his words in my mind as something strange and inexplicable. About a month after the anniversary party, my sister called and said that after visiting him as usual once every two weeks, she found my father on the floor of his kitchen. That morning he fell and was unable to get into the wheelchair on his own. She said he wasn't injured, just confused. I immediately decided to stay with him on Saturday and try to convince him that moving to a smaller place where people could be around to help would be in his best interest. Maybe this time he'll be scared enough to listen? Maybe not. He's a stubborn old brat. Since Stuart and Faye were now home for the summer, I asked, no. I sort of forced them to come with me, playing on my guilt. You guys haven't seen Grandpa for a long time and he won't be with us forever. They agreed to go. Connie said that she would be glad to spend the day in silence and was looking forward to finishing her book. During the hour-long drive, Stuart told me about a girl he met in his Philosophy 101 class that he really liked, and Faye said she was going to finish college without having to deal with boys. After college, there will be plenty of time to pick up a guy. We had a pleasant discussion about the merits of both positions, which inevitably led to me sharing, for probably the hundredth time, how their mother and I met and became a couple. My father was more excited than I had ever seen him in a long time, as the children hugged him and sat down to listen to his old, oft-repeated stories. We had breakfast, talked, and just enjoyed the morning. Around noon, he fell asleep in his chair, and we all left to let him rest. Hey, you guys stay here and watch Grandpa, and I'll be back soon. I need to go get something to cut down that old dead tree in the backyard before it falls on the house. Stuart and Faye went into the living room and watched TV while keeping their eyes on their grandfather. I intended to go home and get a chainsaw, ropes, and everything needed to cut down this tree. 
I don't know why, but I turned onto Highway 40. At the bottom of the hill, I could see the entrance to the Holiday Inn across the street. And again, without wondering why I was doing this, I turned into the motel parking lot. When I stopped and looked around, I saw the stop sign at the bottom of the hill Connie was driving down and how easy it would have been for anyone, even me, to miss. I drove around the parking lot to get out when I saw something that shouldn't have been there. Connie's car. I stopped and looked around to make sure I wasn't imagining anything. I know there are a lot of silver Toyota Camrys out there, but only one has its special license plate, Con Woman. I went out, looked inside, and didn't see anything unusual. The doors were locked. I couldn't think of any legitimate reason why she should be at the Holiday Inn since she told me she wanted to curl up and be alone with a good book, so I thought I'd better see if she knew where her car was. I called home and heard an answering machine. When I called her cell phone, she answered. Hello, dear. How are you? Her voice was cheerful and happy. I don't know why, but I lied, although I had never done such a thing before. Oh, it's okay. I was picking up some things at the grocery store for my dad and decided to call you. I called home, and since you didn't answer, I decided to call my mobile. Where are you? I'm in the shopping center. I finished reading the book and decided to go shopping. You don't mind, do you? Wow, she just lied to me. Well, at least that's what I think. No, just don't spend money from your children's fund on college. What time will you be home? Probably around six. Do you want me to cook dinner? No, I don't think I'll be hungry. I'm starting to not feel very good. So, I can stay with Dad today and send the kids home. I will let you know. Well, okay. Just call me when you decide, she said sadly. Oh, by the way, did you go to the mall alone or with someone? I asked, hoping not to hear another lie. I'm driving and on my own. I arrived here just a few minutes ago. And what? Just wondering. Well, well, I have to go. Have a good time and don't let Greg catch you again for missing the stop sign at the Holiday Inn when you leave today. Bye. I hung up and waited. I didn't know what I was expecting, but that's definitely not what happened. I heard a muffled scream from the direction of the hotel. He looked around but saw nothing, especially the source of the scream. I sat on the hood of Connie's Camry and looked around. A few minutes later, a police car pulled up and Greg got out. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. Did you call 911? Uh, no, Greg. I didn't do that. Well, someone called and said that someone was breaking into a car in the parking lot. I'd better go into the building and talk to the manager. Greg, can you do me a favor? Of course, Mr. Jenkins, whatever. When you enter the building, ask if Mrs. Jenkins is there and who is she with? I'll be right there. Uh, okay, wait. Oh. Damn it. Sorry, Mr. Jenkins. I'll be back soon. I'll find out what's going on. Come back and talk to you. I'm really sorry. He got into the car and drove to the entrance. I waited and waited, but nothing happened. Finally, a siren was heard in the distance. He got closer and closer and finally stopped when he arrived at the entrance to the motel. The paramedics came out. A few minutes later, they loaded someone into the back seat and drove away. Greg came out, drove up, and came out to me with the saddest look on his face I've ever seen. I'm very sorry, Mr. Jenkins. There was a small problem inside. An ambulance took your wife to the county hospital. It looked like she was trying to escape through the sliding glass door. The door didn't break, but she was badly hurt. There was a cut on one eye, and she was hysterical. The gentleman who was with her left when the ambulance left. I have his name, address, and statement of what happened. I'm sorry I can't give you this information, but you can come to the station tomorrow and fill out a Freedom of Information Act form and get it. I repeat... I am very sorry that this happened. I've always considered you and Mrs. Jenkins to be a strong family. He held out his hand for me to shake, but all I could do was stare at it. Tears appeared only after he left. I don't know how I did it, but I drove back to my dad's house and stood in the driveway, not knowing which way to turn. When Faye saw me, she felt that something was wrong and ran out. She asked, what's happened? But I was too stunned to speak. 
She spoke louder and louder until I broke down and cried in front of her. I have never cried in front of my children. She also began to cry when she saw her father disintegrate right in front of her. When Stuart came out, I told them through tears that their mother was in the hospital and that they should go and help her. I didn't say anything else or tell them what I had just experienced. But within seconds, they were in the car and ready to go. I tossed the keys to Stuart and told him I wasn't going. I'll stay here for the night. They looked at me like I was a three-headed snake, but they left anyway. I made sure my dad was okay before collapsing on the couch, feeling my heart pounding out of my chest. I just looked at the floor and cried. Dad rolled out in a stroller and stopped next to me. What happened, Mark? What's bothering you? I was never able to talk to my father about intimate topics. He's an old school dad and always kept his emotions in check, and I think I was a lot like him. Whenever I had problems as a child, he would simply say, Behave like a man, and everything will be fine. I half expected the same advice this time, so I said nothing. But he understood everything. Let me tell you a little story about your mother and me, something I have never told you or your sister or anyone else. Right after you were born, I started getting into trouble with the law. I stole something from work. Your mother wanted that fancy red dress, and I didn't have the money to buy it for her, so I stole the instrument and sold it. I got caught. In the end, I paid the company, but they still fired me and then turned me over to the police. The authorities gave me a probationary period for a year. This was the easy part. Your mother was angrier at me than she had ever been in her life. She was probably very disappointed in me for what I did. This has greatly damaged our marriage. She was cold towards me for a long time. One day she came home and said that she might have found me a new job next door to where she worked and that I could go there in the morning for an interview. Then she hugged me, looked straight into my eyes, and said that she forgives me. Son, she forgave me for almost ruining our marriage. She put aside her pride and let me back into her heart. From that day until her death, I never did anything that she wasn't proud of. I became a better person because your mother loved me. Of course, she was hurt for a while, but she was a better person than me, and we got through it. Mark, I don't know what happened, but you seem to be in the same boat as me. Maybe you need forgiveness, and maybe you need to be forgiven like your mother did, but maybe what happened cannot be forgiven. Whatever the problem, I know in my heart that you will do the right thing and the smart thing. I just hope everything goes well for you. I may not have told you this often, but I am very proud of the man you have grown into, and I love you very much. He placed his old arthritic hand on mine and bowed his head in silent prayer. Having finished, he quietly turned and rolled into the bedroom. I sat on the couch until the sun disappeared below the horizon. The phone rang at night, but I didn't answer. The same thing happened with my mobile phone. I heard them because I didn't sleep all night. I just lay curled up on my dad's old couch and listened to the crickets outside the window. Morning should be a new beginning. Yesterday is gone and today is a new day. But it still seemed to me that I was on the edge of an abyss. After preparing breakfast for my dad, I went out into the backyard alone and got on the moped. Around noon, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Hey, Dad, are you okay? Faye asked, looking down with tired red eyes. Faye sat next to me and wrapped her arms around my neck as if she were three years old again. She was crying, too. We sat there until it was time to talk. I didn't want to say anything because I wasn't sure I could do it without breaking down. So I let Faye start. Dad, Mom is okay. She has a concussion, four stitches in one eye, a broken nose and several bruises, but will physically recover. Emotionally, she is a train wreck. The doctor gives her something to help her relax and fall asleep, but she wakes up screaming your name and it all starts all over again. Megan showed up at the hospital, so we were all there for her. Mom did nothing but ask why you weren't there and cried. Dad, she told us what happened and what she did. You probably already know everything, so I won't repeat what she told us. I want you to know that I was terribly angry with her. I said that was the worst thing you could do to another person, especially someone she said she loved. I said I hate her. She... Wait a minute, girl, I interrupted angrily. Never say that you hate your mother. She loves you and you love her. 
She did something wrong, and I have to figure out what to do about it. Dad, she cheated on you. She lied to you and to us. She doesn't deserve our love. What she did doesn't matter. She's your mother. Yes, she is my mother, but she is also your wife. Do you still love her after what she did? I was silent for a long time, trying to mentally grasp my new world. I don't know. I'm still in shock. I need to get my emotions and thoughts under control before I say or do anything. Right now I am not able to think because my heart hurts so much. I do not know what to do. Dad, I will always be there. Whatever you decide, I will support you. I may not agree with your decision, but I will be there for you. I love you, Dad. We hugged and cried and finally sat back, watching the hummingbird fly back and forth between the hollyhocks and the old oak tree, each of us lost in our own thoughts. I spent the weekend with my dad and talked on the phone with Megan and Stuart. I refused to talk to Connie when they asked. I was not ready for her to see me or hear my words in this state. When Monday morning arrived, I called work and told my boss that I had family problems and needed a couple days off. I spent the next three days sitting in the backyard, wallowing in my sorrows. Faye didn't leave my side. I think she was worried about what I would do. I sat in the backyard and thought about how well Connie and I had had the last 25 years. Not everything was perfect, as in any marriage, but the good times far outweighed the bad. I didn't have the details of what she was doing. In fact, I think my children knew more than I did, but I certainly knew the main thing, and that was what I couldn't stand anymore. It was hard enough knowing the little I knew, but hearing everything described step by step would absolutely kill me. The lunch Faye brought me sat untouched on the table next to the roll of paper towels I used to wipe my tears. It had been two days since my world had been turned upside down, but now I was no clearer in my thinking than I had been yesterday or the day before. Hi, Mark! A familiar voice burst my thought bubble and again launched a whirlwind of emotions. Without turning around, I muttered, Hi, Connie. I waited, motionless and watched as she pulled up a chair in front of me. I didn't know what I looked like, but if I looked half as bad as she did, my next stop would be the morgue. Sorry, Mark, she said, looking at her hands. They had always been beautiful and strong, like everything else about her, but now one of them was covered with a large bruise and the other with a large bandage on the back of her. When I first looked at her face, I saw a terrible bandage running across the middle of her face holding the broken bones of her nose together. A large gauze bandage over one eye hid the eyebrow and the stitches underneath. The other eye was surrounded by a nasty black and orange bruise. She looked, as Faye called it, like a train wreck. She used to be so beautiful, but now she has become so ugly. I don't know how much of my opinion of her appearance was due to my broken heart or whether she had truly become ugly. Mark? I came here to apologize. I know an apology isn't enough to make things right, but it's all I have. Megan brought me here because I was still too upset to drive. I needed to see you, talk to you, and for you to understand what I did, what I did to you, to us. Mark, I screwed up, not you. You didn't do anything wrong. You don't deserve any of this. No matter how much I hurt you, I feel the same pain, if not more because I was the one who did it. The pain was self-inflicted and may have destroyed something that means more to me than life itself. Mark, I want to tell you what happened, and maybe... No, I don't want to hear anything from you. Even what I know now is tearing me apart from the inside. If I hear anything else, you'll just kill me. Don't say anything, please. But Mark, if you find out what happened, then perhaps there is a chance that you will forgive me. Mark. I don't want to lose you, I love you, and you need to understand why I was weak and did what I did. It all started... No, damn it, I told you I don't want to hear anything. But Mark, you have to listen to me. This is the only way I can... No, we can get through this. The only way we can heal and be a family again. Please, Mark, just listen. I said no. I got up and left, leaving her sobbing into my black and blue hands. Dad, please listen to her. Megan said, coming up to me as I walked into the kitchen. She needs you to listen and forgive her. She needs to tell you what she did and apologize so you can move past this. 
I turned, looked at my eldest daughter, and spat out the words that led me down the path that would ultimately lead to my demise. Megan, if you think that listening to her story will fix everything, then you are even more mistaken than she is. If she really needs to ease her conscience, she can write about it in a letter and send it to me. I'm not going to sit here and listen to her excuses for why she abandoned a 25-year marriage and destroyed me in the process. I can't be near her. Now I don't have the strength to forgive her. I got into the car and sped away, not knowing where I was going, when, or if I would return. I didn't cry that much while driving because most of my tears ended up on the bricks of my dad's patio. Now I just needed to get away and think. When I returned to my dad the next day, Faye greeted me at the door with a smile and a hug. At that moment, I needed that smile more than anything in the world. She told me that with all the unhappiness in the world, someone can still be happy. She gave me hope that someday I would be able to smile again. But she didn't tell me if what I decided to do would make anyone else smile. Dad was also happy to see me. As we sat down to dinner, I told my father and daughter about my future. Dad, I decided to move here for a while, to live with you. I need to be away from work, and you need my help with cooking and cleaning. And trust me, Dad, I've tasted enough of your cooking to know that you need someone who can cook you more than just bacon and eggs. Faye, can you help me get some things from the house? I can't go there while your mother is there, and I need some things for work here too. You can tell everyone that I will live here until I find a more permanent solution. For now, just say that your mother and I broke up. Don't go into details. Just leave it as it is. Okay, Dad. I'll come back tonight and get what you want. Just make a list. Do you want me to say something to Mom? Just tell her that I will live here and don't let her call me. When I'm ready, I'll call her myself. I gave her my list and spent the evening discussing our new living arrangements with Dad. From the expression on his face, I realized that he was happy about my return home, but also upset about the reason for it. He made no mention of Connie or the events of the last few days. We even did something we hadn't done for many years, played checkers. Of course he won. When Faye returned with my things, I was surprised to see the car so full. I also took my things, she said firmly. I'll take the guest bedroom and live here until classes start. She had a hard, hard expression on her face as she helped unload our things. Later that evening, I asked her what happened. Faye's face contorted as she began to speak. Can you believe what my sister said? She basically said that you were being childish and that you should go home and make peace with your mom. And Stuart was just as bad. He basically said that at one point or another in their life, everyone cheats on the person they love. No problem, he said. He said that you should just forgive your mom and go and get a girlfriend on the side yourself. Can you believe what these two said? Assholes. Well, you know, Faye. Dad, I'm not in the mood to listen to this. You didn't do anything wrong, and now you're sitting in your grandfather's house, and everyone thinks you're bad. It was mom who ruined everything. She doesn't deserve forgiveness. This is one of the reasons why I am here. These three think you're wrong for not crawling back and apologizing. I can't live with all this, and I put my things in the car when I put yours. Faye was steaming. I knew there was no way to convince her otherwise once she had made up her mind to do something, so I just sat quietly and let her anger burn out. I spent the next two months trying to make my life as normal as possible. I went to work every day helped around the house, and even taught Faye how to make a mediocre vegetable lasagna. Every two days, Megan or Stuart called me and asked when I would be coming home. Connie stood in my mind's eye, waiting for my answer. I told them I was at home with my dad and didn't want to talk to Connie or hear about her. Once or twice they still tried to say something, but I just hung up. One day, Stuart appeared at the door and said he had something important to tell me. We went out to the backyard and sat on the patio so he could say what he wanted. Dad, you must return home immediately. It's been two months now and Mom is worse than ever. I have to go back to college in a couple of weeks and I can't leave Megan alone to take care of her mom. No one knows what she might do when one of us isn't around. She cries all the time, doesn't sleep or eat. I lost a lot of weight. Some of your friends came to visit 
and they are just as worried as we are. She does nothing but sit at home and mope. We tried to get her to go out to eat or go shopping, but she started crying again. Dad, I think you've punished her enough already. You need to get over your petty grievances and go home. She's sorry that you're hurting and it's hurting her. Now forget about it and go home. I sat silently and looked at my son. This is the man I coached in baseball and football and helped him earn his Eagle Scout badge in the Boy Scouts. But he has changed. He was no longer the son who made me proud of my grades and life choices. His values have shifted somewhere to the side. He thinks that what his mother did is good, and if it is good for her, then it will set a precedent that will show that it is good for him too. I have always told my children that promises are very important and should be taken seriously. I always tried to instill good moral values in him, both by word and example. No, I think Stuart's mind is blown now. Stuart, you are a man now and I can tell you as a man to a man. Get the hell out of my house. How dare you come here and accuse me of being immature. I'm not the one who screwed up. If you support what your mother did, then you have changed and not for the better. So, go home and take care of your mother. I'll be here until I decide not to. Now get out of here before I throw your ass out. I got up and entered the house. A few minutes later, I heard his car drive away. Faye returned to college in the last week of August. I hadn't heard anything from Megan or Stuart, so I assumed that Stuart was back at college and Megan was going back and forth between her new husband and Connie. They didn't call me to tell me anything. Now it's just me and Dad left. In mid-September, I received a letter from Connie. I started to read it, but I had to put it back in the envelope and hide it in my dresser. My emotions were too strong. I told Megan that if Connie wanted to ease her conscience, she should put it all in a letter and send it to me. Now that I have it, I can't read it. The wound was still open. Instead, I stuck my head in the sand and continued to live my life as it was. Every couple of days, Faye called to check on my health and, of course, Dad's. She said she talked to Megan and Stuart, and they did the same for their mother. She planned to come visit me at the end of October for my birthday and hoped that I would have already made a decision about the future. Being in limbo does no one any good. I told her we'll talk when I make a decision. On October 30th, I turned 50 years old, which is an important milestone in the life of any man. This morning, Faye showed up and said she was going to invite Dad and me to a big Italian dinner. She wanted to show me the taste of real lasagna. I smiled at her little joke about my cooking. I am sure that this smile was the first in recent months. We returned from the restaurant late, and I took Dad to his bedroom and made sure he was comfortable in bed before returning to Faye. I handed her a beer, and we sat in the living room and talked. So, Dad, can you tell me what you've decided? Faye never believed in a roundabout way. I started with a heavy sigh. I decided that I didn't know everything, including why she did what she did, but my stubbornness and reluctance to talk to her would not solve anything. I finally read her letter, and I'm not sure I believe everything she wrote. This may be true, but I don't understand how anyone could be so stupid. And since this has gone on for so long, I feel that reconciliation is extremely unlikely. But I plan to sit down with her and discuss everything. Maybe we can discuss our problems, maybe not. At least I should give her a chance to say what she wants and for her to hear how I feel. If I still don't believe her, then I simply have no other choice but to file for divorce. I was as unhappy without her as she was without me, according to you. Well... I'll do my best to move forward, no matter how it ends for us. As much as it hurts me, I'm going to meet her and start figuring out where we are. I'll call her tomorrow and... My planned speech was interrupted by Faye's cell phone. I wasn't finished yet, but I let her answer anyway. This is Megan, she said, looking at the phone display. I'll go outside. She got up and went out into the cold night. Five minutes later, she came back in with the biggest saucer-shaped eyes and the palest, ghostly face I've ever seen. She looked at me, at the floor, at the photo above the mantel, at her cell phone, and then threw herself into my arms, sobbing uncontrollably. She cried into my shoulder while I held her tightly, waiting for whatever had caused her turmoil to pass. After a few minutes, she pulled away, brushed away her tears, wiped her eyes with her sleeve, and, looking me straight in the eyes, said, Dad, Mom died. 
This evening, Megan came home and found her in the bathroom. She appears to have swallowed a bottle of pills the doctor gave her to help her sleep. Megan didn't tell me anything else. Everything in the world ceased to exist. I heard what she said, but my brain didn't work. Death was not recorded. I could not understand. I couldn't see, hear, or feel. Is Connie dead? I, I, preparing for the funeral of the only woman I've ever loved, the woman who meant more to me than anything in the last 25 years, the mother of my children, and yet, the woman who had a lover behind my back was a Herculean task. Whenever I was with my children, I tried to appear stoic and reserved, but they all knew that I could barely control myself. At night, I sat in my backyard and looked at the swing that had not been used for 15 years and thought about Megan, Stuart, and Faye, who were growing up and running around like a pack of wild animals, with their mother running at their heels. I looked at the azalea bushes that Connie and I planted after we moved and thought about the good times, the picnics, the gatherings of friends, and the times we made love under the stars. Just knowing she was in my life made me feel warm and comfortable. Now I felt cold and alone. I also had a lot of unresolved feelings to deal with. The biggest unresolved question was how much responsibility I had for Connie swallowing those sleeping pills. I didn't put them in her hands or force her to swallow them, but damn, I helped create her depressed emotional state by refusing to talk to her. I was in pain, and I wanted her to be in pain too. I loved her so much, and she did probably the one thing in our marriage that could destroy me the fastest once I found out. She was my wife, my love, and I loved her more than anything in the world. The fact that she gave herself to someone else destroyed me. And now, perhaps, I destroyed it. I never wanted her to die. I just wanted her to feel what I felt. Maybe she did it and couldn't live with herself. Now, I'll never know for sure. All I know for sure is that she did something bad and ruined our marriage. And I did something equally bad and ruined hers. We were both wrong. May the Lord have mercy on our souls. Tomorrow will be Connie's funeral, and I will see her for the last time. I had to keep my emotions under control. I got to see the faces of all our friends and family. I had to say goodbye. I had to not break. I turned around when I heard the front door slam, and a few seconds later, a car roared down the street. Megan walked towards me from the back door. Dad, are you okay? Megan whispered, sitting down on the chaise lounge opposite me. No, not at all. We sat quietly, collecting our thoughts, listening to the rustle of fallen leaves in the night wind. Megan looked at me and said, You know that none of this would have happened if you had just come home and forgiven her. She made a mistake. I am sure that you also made mistakes for which she forgave you. She said she couldn't live without you. Your pride killed her. I sat silently with my mouth open. My own daughter blamed me for my wife's death. I don't know how many times I've said or thought this, but I didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't me who had the affair. I wasn't the one who lied to my friends and family for six months. I wasn't the one who started taking sleeping pills to ease my guilt. And Dad, tomorrow will be a long, hard day. Then everyone will be invited to the house, and there will probably be a lot of people here. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to be here if you don't want to. Stuart and a few of Mom's friends will help me with food and stuff, so you don't have to worry about that. Now Megan didn't even want me to come to the funeral. What the hell is going on? Maybe I was just so emotional and stressed that I misunderstood what she was saying. One thing I was sure of was that I did not want to get into a confrontation with my daughter on the eve of her mother's funeral. I got up, entered the house, and went down to the living room where I slept. I put all my bedding in the laundry basket and put on a suit and tie. When I got upstairs, the children were already dressed and waiting in the living room. The father looked tired. Faye came over and straightened my tie, just as her mother had done thousands of times before. I kissed her forehead, took her hand, and walked out to the limousine that was waiting for us. Faye held my hand the whole time. She didn't say a word to me or anyone else, but sat with her head down. When we got to the funeral home, many of our friends were crowded into the foyer. When the crowd saw us, they parted and we headed to the observation room. All eyes were on me. But as I walked past our friends and neighbors, I noticed something rather strange. I saw no pity in the eyes of those who looked at me. Most did not even look at my face. 
Instead, an expression of disgust, almost contempt, appeared on their faces. I nodded to the couple and they turned away to talk to someone else. As I walked past my boss from work and his wife, he extended his hand and shook it, telling me how sorry he was. Our friends, standing on either side of him, looked at him with the same strange, contemptuous expression that they looked at me. He was the only one who said anything to me. The children received expressions of condolences from those I had already passed by. I didn't understand what was going on. After all, I didn't have much experience with funerals. The only thing is I was directly involved in my mother's funeral, and it was nothing like it. Faye led me to the coffin, and we knelt to pay our last respects. There was soft, soothing organ music coming from the sound system, but I could still hear the whispers of the crowd behind us. During my silent prayer, I caught snippets of whispered conversation. Merciless bastard. Left her. He... He caused this. Hypocrite. Faye took my hand and squeezed it. She must have heard the same words I heard. The preacher's words were reassuring. The hymn that Connie's longtime friend sang was poignant and sad. It was not an ordinary funeral hymn, but a song that Connie loved very much. At the end, she shook hands with Megan and Stuart and walked to her seat. I found it strange that she didn't say anything to me or Faye. When the preacher asked if anyone had anything to say, several friends addressed the crowd. Megan stood up last and spoke about mercy and forgiveness, how Jesus forgave those who nailed him to the cross, and how we should be as kind to others as he was. I'm not usually this dumb, but sitting here listening to my daughter preach about forgiveness, I got it. Finally, I understood everything. When we approached the grave, the wind was cold and sharp, Everyone stood silently, listening to the preacher's last words. At the end of the service, the priest gave each of us a red rose to place on the coffin when we left. I went first, followed by Faye, Megan, and Stuart. An old work friend of his father rolled him past the coffin. It was one of the most emotional days of my life. I reached out to stop Megan and Stuart before we left the grave. With all the bile I was capable of, I said what was boiling in my heart. Megan, Stuart, I realized what was happening and made a decision. Because of what you did, because of the hatred you spread, because of the moral stand you took in defending your mother and making me mean and mean to all of our friends and family, both of you are the same to me dead, just like the woman we just buried. Don't ever talk to me, don't come to my house, or interact with me at all. From now on, I am no longer your father. I turned and looked at my former friends who had gathered and said, This applies to all of you, too. They were shocked by my shameless expression of hostility. Without another word, I took Faye's hand, and we walked back to the limousine. When my father and the stroller were put in the car, I told the driver to drive away, leaving Megan and Stuart standing by the road. The only people who came to my wake were my boss, his wife, and two old friends from the street. These were all the friends I had left in this world, them and Faye, of course. Megan and Stuart went to her home to receive condolences. Faye later said that they had all heard that I had abandoned Connie after she made a small mistake and refused to talk to her or forgive her, which led to her committing suicide. In other words, everyone knew that it was I who killed my wife. Faye returned to college leaving me alone and without friends. When she returned between semesters and spring break, it was like turning on a light in a dark and dreary room. Megan stayed with her husband and his family while Stuart returned to college. In between semesters, he did other things. The only thing that made any sense was to focus on work and try to forget the pain of the past. That was not easy. Two or three times a week, I would wake up in the middle of the night expecting Connie in bed next to me, or to the terrifying image of her and John Jablonski having fun in their room at the Holiday Inn. She told me in a letter that her lover was our old neighbor. About two years ago, he and his wife moved to the other side of town. Time passed, and the pain became easier to bear. Megan gave birth to a girl and named her Connie. A year later, she gave birth to a little boy, whom she named Chance, after her husband's father. I didn't see my grandchildren. Stuart married the girl of his dreams. 
whom he told me about in college. I received an invitation to their wedding, but didn't go. Two years later, she filed for divorce. Apparently, he followed his mother's example and cheated on his own wife. He said that everyone cheats, at one time or another, and I think it was this warped attitude that led to his divorce. He moved to California, and I haven't seen him since the funeral. I know all this because Faye inserted little tidbits of information into the conversation at every opportunity. She wanted me to be aware because, no matter how wrong they were, they are still my children. My best friend in the whole world was my boss at work. He helped when I needed to talk and looked away when I was too sick to work. At the very beginning, he even told me that he would give me a year to get myself in order, otherwise he would have to replace me. This little speech motivated me to become the best manager in the company, so good that I was offered a senior manager position in Florida, four years into my new life. Within three months, I sold my house, moved everything to a new, much smaller house in Orlando, and began running an entire distribution center in the eastern United States. I lost all my friends in Maryland. Only a couple of people could even talk to me, let alone invite me somewhere. Everything was not the same as before, and all but a very few turned their backs on me and left me alone. I was persona non grata and invisible to everyone. Faye graduated with honors and landed an exciting entry-level management position at one of Florida's largest entertainment venues. She said she would live with me until she found a place to live. Hopefully, it won't be too soon. Dad died a year after Connie. It's been five years since my world changed. I lost everything that was dear to me. Everything except one thing, my daughter Faye. But even she sought to create a life for herself. I had to find my own or I would be destined to die a miserable old man with no one to love but my golden retrievers. Boy, doesn't that sound pathetic? Let's face it, I needed something to do. I have always had a hobby, writing. For the last few years, all I've done is write business reports, but as my job became routine and I got older, I started writing short stories again and even sold a couple to a local literary magazine. One weekend, while Faye was on a date with her boyfriend, I began a rough outline of what I thought would be another story. It became an outline for a story about a particularly difficult part of my life and ended up being much more than a short story. I thought long and hard about how to start it because I knew it would bring up memories and emotions from the past that would rather lie dormant in the dark recesses of my mind. One evening I started writing it. Four months later, working every evening after my day job, I had a completed first draft of a manuscript that I thought was pretty good. But I didn't want anyone to read my deepest secrets, so I put it in a box and put it on a shelf in my office. While writing, catharsis occurred, I faced the demons of my past, and they were defeated. I discovered that I could start living again. I enrolled in a creative writing class at a local college in hopes of improving my writing skills. Mostly there were 20-year-old children who could not distinguish an adverb from an adjective. There were two other old people in the class just like me, so we teamed up to show the youth of America, or at least the youth of Orange County, Florida, how to write well. Maurice had retired and was planning to write a book about his family's role in the Civil War. Alicia was a widow working on a local college course catalog to keep herself busy and find something she could be good at. She raised five children as a stay-at-home mom, and when they were all gone, she quietly retired and moved to Florida, using the insurance money she received when her husband died as seed money for a new life. The more Alicia and I talked, the more we found in common. I learned early on to let the girl I was dating talk and listen carefully to everything she said, because there were always follow-up questions later. I hadn't dated in almost 30 years, so I had to pay very close attention to her. She spoke, and I took notes, that is, mental notes. One day she realized that she was the only one doing all the talking and asked me where I was from and why I lived alone in Central Florida and went to a local college. I gave her the 30-minute shorter version and tried to bring the conversation back to her, but she wouldn't do it. She questioned me again and again until I finally told her that my story was hard to tell, and if she wanted to know about me, she should come to my house for dinner next Saturday. She gave me the biggest, most beautiful smile I've seen in years and said, 
Yes, with pleasure. Dinner was wonderful, Mark, Alicia said as we walked out onto the patio to enjoy the night air under one of my palm trees. I know few men who even know how to cook vegetable lasagna, and especially one as good as this one. What other surprises do you have up your sleeve? I think you know almost everything about me. I manage the Folks Industries Distribution Center on the east side. My daughter Faye lives with me, and she kindly agreed to leave tonight. My wife died a little over five years ago. I have two other children. And you met my two golden retrievers, Bo and Luke. That's it in a nutshell. And so, I'm bored. There's nothing interesting to tell. Well, you bribed me by saying that if I wanted to know your story, you would tell it to me. Come on. I'm waiting for all the gory details. Instead of saying anything, I got up and went into the house. When I returned, I had a box in my hands with my novel. A novel about the biggest events in my life. You don't know, but I've been writing for many years and even sold a couple of stories to a local literary magazine. I have a computer full of stories, some based on my life story, and some just popped out of my twisted little brain. Before I signed up for a creative writing course, I wrote something that I wasn't quite sure what to do with. A sad story about me and my family, all here in this little box. Writing this down helped me overcome the pain I felt when my wife died and my family fell apart. I've never shown it to anyone before, but I'd like to hear your opinion. I think it's only good as a stop to hold the door open on windy nights. But I'd really like to hear from someone whose work I admire. She looked at me with eyes full of admiration. I will read your book with pleasure. What is it called? I called it Fair Weather Friends. Wow, you're so heavy, she said, taking the box from my hands. Just 987 pages. I want you to tell me what you think. Be honest, brutal if you have to, but I want someone other than me to comment on it. I don't want to show it to my daughter because she went through everything I wrote about and it would just bring up old feelings again. I don't want to hurt her. Mark, I will be happy to read your novel and express my opinion. One thing I may have forgotten to tell you is that I am very confident. I call it like it is, and let the chips fall where they may, or whatever that old cliché says. I'll start tomorrow. We talked about our writing class, Florida nightlife for people our age, and ended up exchanging opinions about some of our favorite movies. We had a pleasant evening, and this time the Florida weather helped. As I walked her to the car, she kissed me on the cheek. I felt like a teenager again, cleaning up after our little dinner. At the next class meeting, Alicia wasn't there, and I didn't hear anything from her after our dinner. I was beginning to wonder if I seemed to her like some kind of psycho who should be avoided at all costs. I thought about calling her, but I didn't want to seem intrusive. Two weeks later, she called me herself when I was not at home, and left a message on my answering machine. Hi, Mark. This is Alicia. I want you to come to my place for dinner on Friday night. My son is in the city. He will stay with me for a few days, and I want you to meet. There might be a little surprise waiting for you here when you arrive, so bring a bottle or two of that wonderful white wine we had the other day and be here at seven. Call me back and let me know. Bye. On Friday evening, I dressed casually but nicely and took with me two bottles of Balthazar Ress Riesling Cabinet, Hattenheimer Schutzenhaus, 2012. I read in a local Orlando magazine that this was one of the best white wines of the year, and since I knew nothing about wines, I decided to trust the author of the article. It was good with the lasagna, and I hoped it would be just as good with what Alicia served. Hey, Mark, come in. Alicia's face lit up as she showed me her house. When we walked out onto the patio, I saw a small table set for three, with candles and wine glasses. A man stepped out from behind two orange trees toward the illuminated dining table. Mark, meet me. This is my son, Barry. Barry, this is Mark Jenkins. It's very nice to meet you, he said as we shook hands. Mom told me a lot of good things about you. She's impressed, and it takes a lot to impress her. Nice to meet you, too, Barry. But whatever she said, it was most likely just a fantasy from our creative writing class. There's not much that's exciting about me. Alicia smiled and pointed to the table. As we sat down, she took the bottles of wine and put them in the refrigerator. When she finally sat down, she smiled her big, beautiful smile again and took my hand. Mark, 
I invited you here under false pretenses. We will eat as soon as the wine has cooled. But first I want to talk and tell you exciting news. I think it will be a real surprise for you. Hopefully a good one. My curiosity peaked. But at the same time, I was more than a little excited. Mark, my son is here today to meet you because I did something that you might not have approved of if I had asked you in advance. But I did it, and now it's too late. So if you're going to get angry, just go ahead and do it. Okay, here's what I did. I devoured your book in two days, and it completely amazed me. I couldn't put it down until I was about halfway through. It was the most inspiring and heartbreaking story I have ever read. I cried at the end of the chapter where you went to live with your father after finding out about your wife. I cried at the end when you talked about your children. Mark, this is the most fantastic book I have ever read, and I had to share it with my son. I mailed it to him, and he read it. He doesn't usually read unsolicited books by unknown authors, but he did so at my request. He is my son, and he had no choice. Mark, he liked it too and wants to help you edit it so you can publish it. Isn't this fantastic? I sat silently and looked at her, and she smiled back at me. I didn't know what to say or do. I probably looked pretty stupid, but I couldn't help it. When I looked at Barry, he smiled back and began where his mother left off. Mom is right, Mr. Jenkins. This is the best first novel I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them. You see, I work at Prentice Press in New York and am the assistant chief in charge of selecting submissions from authors like you. We receive about a hundred new books a month, and I have to read and rate them all before sending them off for two more screenings. If we all agree that what we read is worthy of publication, we work with the author to have his manuscript edited and prepared for publication. Your book has gone through this process and we want to publish it. After dinner, we can talk about the details, but for now, I want to congratulate you on creating such a moving book. This is a real breakthrough. I was stunned. Now, I'm sure that my expression went from stupid to completely idiotic in the blink of an eye. Alicia's smile increased tenfold when she saw me sitting there with a stupid look on my face, not knowing what to say. Finally, she got up, kissed my forehead, and went to take out dinner. Sometime after the salad, my voice returned. We talked about my book and specific parts of the story. I saw Alicia cry when we talked about some of the chapters, and I know I did too. We ate Alicia's version of steamed Golden Dorado and talked some more. As we ate the sweet peach pie, Barry gave a quick rundown of the process and the work I needed to do. He talked about promoting the book and what I could expect in terms of royalties. I won't get rich from it. By the time he excused himself and went to bed, my head was spinning from everything I had just learned. Alicia poured out the rest of the wine, and we sat together in the cool night breeze and talked about what it was like to become a famous writer like Stephen King or J.K. Rowling. I wasn't in their league, but it was a lot of fun to fantasize about it a little. It was already after midnight when I returned to Earth and decided that it was time to return home. Alicia walked me to the car and this time didn't just kiss me on the cheek. I received a full-on, deep, soulful kiss that reminded me that I may be 55 years old, but I'm still alive. Over the next three months, I worked with one of the editors at Prentice Press to correct and polish my manuscript. We did it all with one face-to-face -face meeting and a whole bunch of emails and phone calls. The first thing I had to do was transfer my version from MS Word to the software package they recommended. I found it to be very easy to use when editing, but quite clunky when creating whole new parts from scratch. Once we were both satisfied with the final product, the printed proof sheets arrived via overnight FedEx mail, and I spent the entire weekend going through them sentence by sentence, word by word. No matter how many times I read it, there was always something that could be changed that I was just sure would make them 100% better. My editor warned me this would happen. She was right, as always. I worked all day at Folks Industries and all evening on a novel. Faye was delighted with my book. I told her she couldn't read it until I received the first copy from the publisher. She made sure I ate, exercised, and watched the evening news before bed. She looked like an old hen. Alicia came only on weekends. She said she didn't want to suck the creative juices out of me. 
We would go out to dinner, or I would cook something at home. We talked about everything. Nothing was forbidden. I don't think any expensive psychiatrist could have done more for me than she did. The more I talked about my past, the better I felt. Obviously, I could never forget what Connie did to me and what I did to her. Now I realized that we were both to blame, and all this came to light. Our friendship had progressed greatly, and the day I sent Prentice the final changes to my proofs, she said she was going to reward me for finishing the writing. She stayed the night, and we rewarded each other over and over again. Faye came home for a few minutes, but as soon as she realized that I had guests, she returned and stayed with her boyfriend. Alicia gave me a new appreciation for life. My book hit the stores on the 1st of May. I was contractually obligated to do several personal book signing appearances around the country, one of which happened in Ellicott City, my old hometown in Maryland. I was both alarmed and scared by this. I took three weeks off and went on a book tour. One can imagine the author's life as glamorous and uncomplicated. The reality is that this is anything but that. For 28 days, my routine was to board a plane or train to a new city, check into a hotel, and, without unpacking because I wasn't going to be there long enough, go to the book signing and talk to everyone in the long line of well-wishers and fans about how my book changed their lives. I really enjoyed talking to everyone at the book signings, but the travel and hotels got old very quickly. In two cities, Alicia showed up unannounced for me to sign her book, and my tour signing routine turned into absolute joy. She acted shy and modest, and I played a world-famous writer seducing one of the local women. She spent the night with me and helped me get rid of all the ailments that air travel can cause. Every time she left, I felt an emptiness in my existence, where she used to be. We talked on the phone, but it wasn't the same as holding her in my arms. I was beginning to feel something that I had not felt for many years, something in my heart that only a lover could understand. I hoped she felt the same. The last stop on my tour was my old hometown. I asked if they could arrange for it to be the last one, and Prentice was very accommodating. I knew very well the bookstore where I would meet the public, since it was only a few miles from my old home. The event was supposed to start at noon and last until four. When I arrived at the store, there was already a long line of people waiting in front of a table where about 50 copies of my book were neatly laid out, along with a large poster with a photo of me on the dust jacket and a photo of the book announcing the time when I would be able to sign books. I looked around and saw several people in line that I remembered. First in line were my old boss and his wife. I immediately walked up to them and hugged them both before I was told to sit down and start signing. We exchanged phone numbers, addresses, and emails, and I promised to come back and invite them both to dinner. I was so happy to see them that I almost forgot about the growing line behind them. I signed books, chatted a bit, and smiled at everyone in line. A couple of times I got up to take a photo with someone. Overall, it was a much better experience than I expected. About half an hour after I started, one of my old friends came over and handed me a book. He was one of those people at Connie's funeral who wouldn't look me in the eye or talk to me. I signed the book to my old friend and then smiled at him and shook his hand in a friendly manner. And then he did something I never expected. I'm very sorry that I treated you like that. I didn't know until I read the book. He turned around embarrassed and walked away. Similar apologies came in from several of my former friends throughout the day. People I called friends apologized for the way they treated me or judged me. I was almost embarrassed when they left. The most surreal moment came when Lenore Jablonski walked up to the table with a copy of my book to be signed. She came up with an awkward smile and said, Hi, Mark. It's a shame we met again after everything that happened, but I thought I should meet you face to face and sympathize a little. I can't apologize enough for what John did to you, but if it makes any difference, you should know that I kicked him out shortly after, well, after Connie died. We've been divorced for four years and I'm engaged to a contractor in Annapolis. Oh, and just in case you heard anything, there were rumors around town that you were looking for John to sort of get revenge for the pain he caused. He must have heard about it because one day he quit his job and took a job in Saudi Arabia as a computer consultant. I haven't seen him since then. And yes, I started this rumor. She stood in front of the table, 
smiling, and holding out a book. I didn't know what to do or what to say. After a minute of silence, during which we simply looked at each other, I took the book and signed, Lenora, friend, not only in good weather, I hope that some of the words in my book will help you find your own liberation, as I found mine. Thanks for listening. I walked around the table, and we hugged for a minute before she left. At the end of the appointed time, there was still a line in front of the table. I looked up and was very surprised. Megan was standing at one of the bookshelves and looking at me. She didn't come over, didn't say anything, and looked completely depressed. When I looked up after signing another book, she was gone. I stood up and looked around, but she had already disappeared. Faye was the last one in line. We hugged and chatted for a while as she walked me to her car. She drove me back to the hotel, and no, it wasn't the Holiday Inn, and we sat in the car for a while, talking about Alicia. Faye liked it, and she hoped I did too. When I told her that I thought I was in love with her, she threw herself on my neck and began to cry. As luck would have it, just as she was hugging me, a police car pulled up and flashes its headlights. Sergeant Gregg got out of the car and knocked on the window. Once we all got to know each other, it was like old times. We chatted, laughed, hugged, and I told him what I was doing in the city. He hadn't read my book, so I took one of mine and signed it for him. I wrote on the cover, Greg, know that you changed my life. No hard feelings. Someone had to do it. Greg left on call, and Faye and I went out to dinner. All in all, returning to where it all started was not as traumatic as I expected. It was a big shock to see Megan standing on the other side of my door. Alicia and I had just finished breakfast and were talking about the latest New York Times bestseller list and how Fairweather Friends is now number three in the nonfiction genre. But all this disappeared into oblivion when I saw my daughter. Hi, Dad. How are you? Megan asked with a hint of embarrassment in her voice. Hello, Megan. I'm fine. What can I do for you? I was just in the neighborhood and decided to pop in and see how you were doing. This area is 900 miles from yours, Megan. A little out of your way, isn't it? I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned around to see Alicia. Would you like to introduce me, Mark? She asked with a note of command in her voice. Alicia, this is my daughter, Megan. Alicia pushed past me and hugged Megan tightly. Come in. I've heard so much about you. The two women completely ignored me as they entered the living room. They sat down and talked nonstop for an hour, leaving me to clean the kitchen and do other household chores. I only walked past the living room a couple of times while I was cleaning, and they were both talking and giggling. Alicia oohed and odd as Megan showed her photos of her children. Honey, come here and join us, Alicia called. Hearing the order, and I realized that it was an order, I went out and sat next to her. She grabbed my hand more to hold me than as a sign of love. Megan looked at our intertwined fingers. The silence lasted longer than was comfortable. Okay, since you both won't say anything, I'll do it, Alicia said hoarsely. Mark, I invited Megan here because she wants to tell you something. I knew you wouldn't invite her, so I invited her myself. I know that I am just a guest in your house, but if you want me to continue to be a guest, then you will sit here and listen to her. My eyes darted between Megan and Alicia. They literally surrounded me. I didn't want to start a new battle, so I leaned back and prepared to listen. Dad, I came here to find out how you are doing. I also came to apologize to you. Dad, I was wrong about many things, and first of all about you. I was convinced that everything that happened to Mom, Stuart, and me was your fault. I saw only part of what was happening then. Only after reading your book did I see everything from your point of view. I felt so stupid when I read what you wrote and how hurt you were by everything. I guess I never thought you had feelings. After all, when we were little, you almost never expressed any emotion. Your book helped me grow up a little. I never understood that I am a grown woman with a husband and children, but at the same time, to you, I am still an innocent little girl. I always considered my mother a saint, even after what she did to you. You were always strong confident and oblivious to everything that happened in the world, but now I see that you used it as a shield to protect your feelings. 
Mom broke through that shield and hurt you more than I could have ever imagined. I believed that if you could be as strong with her and tell her that you forgave her and come home, then everything would be fine. What I didn't realize was that you were strong, strong enough to give up on someone you'd loved for over 25 years to protect us all from her mistake. Dad, I'm sorry I didn't do you justice. Instead, I left you and told everyone we knew that it was all your fault. After my mother died, I told people that she died because of what you did. I was wrong, and now I know it. I just started to undo what I did. I bought many copies of your book, took them to all your mom's old friends and asked them to read it. I told each of them that you did nothing wrong and that you were hurt more by what happened than anyone could imagine. I saw you at the signing a few weeks ago and stood watching you. I wanted to come up and hug you, but I didn't have the courage. I'm here today to apologize and ask if you would be willing to be a part of my life again. More than five years have passed. You have two of the most beautiful little grandchildren you have ever seen. I want you to come home. I want you to be my father again. I don't want to be dead to you anymore. I love you, Dad, and I want you to love me again. Please. Megan put her head in her hands and cried. And then I felt a pang of guilt. When I looked at Alicia, I saw that she was looking at me, waiting for me to do something. I thought about what she said and how I could handle the situation. Thinking about this, I decided on delay tactics. What about Stuart? I asked Megan. How does he feel about me? Did he know you were coming here? Stuart is such an ass. I think what Mom did hurt him the most. After Lori caught him cheating and divorced him, he moved to California and began living there. For the past few years, he has been bouncing from one girlfriend to another. From what I heard, he was with a married woman whose husband objected to their activities quite strongly, and Stuart decided to leave town rather than face the consequences. He still believes that everyone changes and that it's not a big deal. He doesn't know I'm here, and I don't care what he thinks. Well, her little tirade didn't give me enough time to think about what I wanted to do, so I decided to wait again. Megan, what are your plans now? You will stay in the city. Do you have somewhere to stay? I'll stay with Faye. She wanted me to check out her new apartment, so I'm going to stay there for a couple of days and then come home. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll think about everything you said today and let you know what I decide. This is the best I can do now. Dad, to be honest, I didn't even expect this. Thank you. Now I'll go to Faye. Alicia, it was nice to finally meet you. I hope we meet again soon. Take care of my father. Megan left as suddenly as she appeared. I had a lot to think about, but this time I had a guide who wouldn't let me do anything stupid. Alicia was now a part of me and I couldn't imagine my life without her. When I had a moment alone without Alicia, I gave vent to my emotions. I didn't want her to see me cry. When Alicia and I returned from our Caribbean cruise, we immediately flew to Maryland. The cruise was a gift from Prentice Press because Fairweather Friends had reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. I met my two grandchildren, now two and four, and showed Alicia around the city. There were many memories in the old house and Megan and I began to create new ones, as father and daughter again. Alicia had a lot of experience being a grandma and gave me some very helpful tips to help with the awkward moments. But the best moment came over dinner with Megan's family when I told them that Alicia and I had decided to get married. We had made a decision about our cruise and wanted to tell Megan the second. Faye has already started planning the wedding. We were going to visit Alicia's children and tell them the news. Alicia and I are very happy. We both said that when we were younger, we never expected our lives to turn out the way they did. With the naivety of our youth, we believed that we were invincible and that our first true love would also be our last. Everything happened not as in some fairy tale, but as in the real lives of millions of other people. I was happy with Connie for 25 years and hope to be just as happy with Alicia for the next 25. Maybe I'll write another book about this. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next 